Hey, Snackers, this is Kareem Iskander. Hey, everyone, Matt and Ampli here. Welcome to episode 169 of Snack Minute. Uh, we're going to switch it up today and do a little Q&A episode with our most prolific guest, uh, Quinn Snyder. Uh, Quinn, if you don't mind introducing yourself for those Snackers who may have missed you over the course of the like 32 times you've been on Snack Minute, <laughs> Please, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, I'm Quinn. I'm a technical advocate with Cisco Learning and Certification. So I uh, do a lot of Cisco Live presentations, do a lot of snack minutes, a lot of demos, outreach the community, reach back in to our product teams and things. So kind of everywhere when it comes to, to everything learning and search inside of Cisco. We also have feeding us the questions, um, our colleague, Emma Pierce. Emma, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself and then we'll get right to it. And the producer of this show too. Oh, yes. The producer of the show. Yes, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Long time fan. So I'm I'm super excited to be here to ask you guys some questions. So I'm a content producer from um, like a customer facing marketing team at Learning at Cisco. And some of the highlights of the job is getting to work with you guys, the tech advocates. And it's also um, getting to work with the Cisco community through different um advocacy groups that we have, whether it's Cisco Insider Advocates, Cisco Champions, and the VIPs. And so with that in mind, um, I have sourced some questions from Google, from the community, and some questions I've always wanted to ask you guys. So uh, we have we have a, a handful of questions, and um, we can get started. Let's do it. Okay, so the first question, they sort of vary between kind of entry level, uh, moving up to expert, sort of some some things about Cisco that um, maybe new people who are new to Cisco might want to know. But the first question is, what is the best Cisco certification? <laughs> That's a hard one. I have my opinion. Oh, great. Cream, cream, you go first. Okay. I mean, it's it's really hard to to just say the best because that's a little bit subjective to what you're after. My favorite, actually, I, I've recently and 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 I'll explain why it's my favorite is the DevNet Expert. It's really hard, and it's <laughs> you know we've been doing DevNet for a while, and I you know I failed it miserably, but again, um, but I think the the reason why it's my favorite is because. It puts in perspective everything that we've been talking about and we've been doing with DevNet and automation. And there's a spin to like a really fun kind of story line. I can't talk too much about it, but like there's a fun storyline in the in the exam that you have to read. And it puts you in this position where how, this is this is the real world and this is how you would interact with the the different teams in in the organization to automate or work on an automation project. So I'd have to say the DevNet expert. That's a good answer. Dwayne, what do you feel like? I'm going to take the opposite track as Kareem and not only give my favorite uh, exam, but also be shorter. Usually I'm the verbose one. I'm just going to go out there and say CCNA because without the CCNA, nothing else in terms of networking, in terms of like your subnetting, your router configuration, your switches, none of that is possible. It's your foundation. It's a start. CCNA is my favorite. Oh, that's a good one. Do I have to answer? Yes. <laughs> um, I I liked the um, the actually I liked the uh, enterprise networking automation exam. Um, I thought that that was probably the most practical one. Does that one even exist anymore? Yeah, auto. Yeah. Um, I thought it was really good. It covered our uh, campus and branch technologies really well from an API integration standpoint. So that was my favorite one. Probably the most useful one in the automation space is the DevNet Associate. That's a really good entry entry point into that though. Those are those are definitely some good good answers. Uh, the next question is why are Cisco certifications so hard? I'm not sure I agree with that statement. They're yeah, they they're not hard per per se. They are fair. You have all the resources that you need to pass. It's just a matter of one, um, dedicating the time and study for it, and two practice, 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 and get the hands on. So I, I'm not sure I would say it's hard. I think the hard part is the time and time and studying effort. But Quinn, you have some, I can see you have some opinions on this. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think it's one of those things where you, you've got to go a little bit beyond. I mean, uh, before you guys knew me, I was a network engineer doing large scale deployments for 10 years for a Cisco partner. And you always run into these things where stuff wouldn't work 100% of the way, or you expect it to be one thing, but it was kind of associated with that thing, but it ended up being this thing. The, the exams are kind of the same way. It's, it's you see this blueprint item and it may say configure this. Well, 
configuring that is just one piece of it. There's all those subsequent levels below and above it that are also involved with that. It's not necessarily hard. It's just being able to understand that this one item may mean a, a, a number of things underneath it because that's the, I mean, this isn't easy. If it was easy, everyone would be in networking, right? And so there's there's a level of complexity there that just is inherent in what we do. And, and I think the tests are very fair to your point, Kareem, making sure that you're getting to that point. It's not just this one item. It's all of the stuff around that item. Yeah. I think one of the harder aspects of potentially a Cisco certifications versus some other industry technology certifications is that Cisco covers as a company a broad area of technology. And so for some of the more generalized um, certifications, you're asking a lot of knowledge um, from tech to tech that you wouldn't necessarily uh, ask for people in more specialized scenarios. So I, I think that probably plays into the more challenging aspects of the uh, Cisco certifications. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, sort of how how do I choose the right certification track? What What do you like to do? The only answer that I will give is is you know you have to have a foundation. You have to have that that basis for understanding. But as you go about your your certification journey, if you're it's just like picking a college major or you know figuring out what to do in your free time. If you if you Matt, I know you like to run, but if I said let's go let's go ride bikes together, you'd be like, no, I don't like doing it, and I'm not going to. It's the same. I like riding bikes too. It's the same thing. If you don't like doing what you're what you're studying for, it's going to be a chore, and you're going to hate it eventually. So, what do you like to do? And then go follow your follow your heart. Yeah, that's a really good really good insight on that, Quinn. I think, I think to me, it's what is it that you want to do that determines which track you should go. What is it that, you, where do you want to end up? Like, do you want to end up in, you know, working on uh, deploying networks and troubleshooting networks and maybe working with massive in infrastructure and install and all of that? Then probably the enterprise networking track is for you. Are you coming from like, a security background and you want to build on that knowledge, the cyber ops track is for you. Do you want to just, you've done both of that and you want to get into something that's more kind of on top of all of that from a network automation layer, then the DevNet is for you. So where is it, what is it that you want to do day to day? And I think if you can answer that, you can decide which track works best for you. But I think, um, Quinn, you had brought up comparing it to like picking a college major. The nice thing potentially about these cert different certification tracks is that the time commitment um, mainly is up to you. But I think within a couple of months, maybe you can figure out, hey, I'm starting to study this. I'm not necessarily getting the baseline concepts. Let me try something else. You don't run into a situation where you can overcommit and then um, not be able to go back and not pivot. And so that's kind of the fun thing is you can try these different flavors and probably depending on the amount of bandwidth you have, maybe try a couple at a time and sit there and go, well, I'm definitely going to try a security track. And I think um, the networking space is probably where I'm at. So I'm going to do those two at the same time. And then if I'm interested in, in automation programmability in the future, I'll jump into that. It's kind of like with anything new, if you're not necessarily sure about what you want to do, try it out. And, um, you know, you might find you like bike riding. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, this is a question that I've seen on Reddit a couple of times. Can I pass the CCNA without labbing? I'm going to take it soon, and, and we'll see. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could, you could pass it. I don't know. If, I don't know. You could pass it without labbing, maybe, but I'm not sure that's beneficial to you because um, the whole purpose of of take of getting certified is validating your um, kind of on job skills that you need. And so on job skills that you need is going to require you to lab and get <laughs> into the CLI and configure and troubleshoot and look at routes. And, and if you can't do that on a certification exam, I'm not sure how you can do it for your employer. It's, it's a tough question to answer. It's, it's, you could get lucky and just pass it, um, by answering everything else correctly, minus the lab portions, the, the lab lit sections. Um, but it's not, it's not real. If you, if you have an incredibly photographic memory and can memorize pictures of command outputs, um, and you're in that 0.1% of people, you probably could. Other than that, it's not, even if you can't, it's not worth it to your point, Kareem. I don't have anything colorful to add to that. I think those are great answers. <laughs> okay. So CML versus track it pacer, which one is better? 
I'll, I'll take this. So I, I, I work a lot with both Packet Tracer and CML for some organizational 401c3 work that I do, or 501c3, sorry. They have pros and cons. Uh, Packet Tracer is going to give you a lot more options. So we can drag and drop WLCs. You can simulate virtual access points. You can do a lot of things that have been programmed inside of the software because it's not a full uh, uh, DNF. It's not an actual piece of hardware. It's something we've, we've, we've developed and we've, we've simulated the outputs and things like that. Um, it also gives you the ability to like virtually plug in cables so you know where things connect that you don't necessarily get with with cml free cisco modeling labs free cisco modeling labs is great because um as i've said before it's actual virtual instantiations of these pieces of hardware uh it's a little bit more limited to what you can deploy um but on the plus side of it when you go you know kareem mentioned the the lablets and the ccna and then you know ccnp encore and other pieces um those simulation, those lablets actually run the same software that's inside of uh, Cisco Modeling Labs free. So you get to study on the, the pieces that you will be uh, asked to configure in the lab. So that's that's definitely beneficial uh, on that end. Um, I, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both depending on where you're looking to, to go. I'm just going to add one thing to that is I think everything that Quinn said and skills skill level is where this, it, the decisive factor for me is, are you entry? Like, have you've never done any, any networking or any even network automation and you're looking to get started with that, maybe at a CCST level, Packet Tracer is your entry point. If you've been doing network automation or networking in general for a while, couple of years, and you've dabbled with real hardware, um, and you're looking to expand and maybe touch on hardware that you don't have access to, uh, uh, Cisco Modern Lab Free is is a good way to go, but that's that for me is the, the decisive factor between the two. But the materials, from an education standpoint, the materials will help kind of help dictate what you're going to use for those labs, and um, and then you will ultimately develop the skills with both of those tools that will help you decide which one is, is uh, for your for your case, right? Uh, Quinn, I, I want to know this is how much Quinn loves what we do. He not just does it for his job, but he does it for his volunteer work as well. So kudos to you, Quinn, on that one. Okay, so I have heard DevNet described as an art form. What is DevNet? That DevNet. is a loaded question. <laughs> loaded question that Matt should start with. I'm going to give the, uh, so I have like a 45-minute diatribe on that that I will not put everyone through. Um, DevNet started out as a way for <clears throat> our community um, our customers, our partners within Cisco to have access to um, automation and programmability concepts. Um, it was started as an educational group and it was uh, filling a niche that Netacad and learning and certifications at the time just didn't have. And it was really exciting because we knew that we were providing that educational aspect for it. Learning and certifications now with uh, Quim and, or Quim, Quinn and Kareem. Um, they have that now. And so DevNet has, has uh, pivoted. So DevNet is a concept um, in that we talk about automation and programmability against Cisco platforms. Um, and you can think of it more generally that way. It's also an organization within Cisco that is um, pivoting currently to alter or, or to support um, the automation and programmability aspects of Cisco platforms for business enablement. So um, we've moved out of that education space as an organization. We're moving more into um, that enablement space for our customers and partners. Um, and we're leaving the education to the to the geniuses here. The, the one thing I would add in is, is that when you're writing code for network automation, it can be an art form. It's just, unfortunately, mine usually looks like a Jackson Pollock painting or maybe a Picasso if I'm <laughs> really, really, does. really good. <laughs> Just get it to work, man. Sometimes that's the best way. Okay. So what is um, the difference between IPv4 and IPv6? All right. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> I am not qualified to talk in details about this, so I'll let the genius in the room, Quinn, to give us a little bit more. And there, we have a lot of actually great content and sessions. Uh, I know Nicole does an awesome IPv6 session, which we had her on Snack Minute um, a while ago. So, um, but Quinn, maybe you can answer that one for us. 
Yeah, I mean, IPv4, uh, what is it? It's, um, you know, 4 billion addresses available based on the, the standard dotted decimal that we're all used to using. It was developed at a time where, you know, a large organization would get a slash eight. So they'd get, you know, 16 million addresses or something like that. Um, the growth of the internet has has changed that. And I want to say, you know, Nicole, don't don't hate on me. Still supply me with Stroop waffles when we meet. <laughs> I would say, if, you know, maybe a decade or a decade and a half later, they came out with IPv6 to expand that to like 16 quintillion addresses or something like that because we've gone to 128-bit space instead of 32. So now I think everyone on the planet Earth can get like 4 billion IP addresses and still have some left over. It's just a larger addressing boundary. It looks more confusing because there's hexadecimal numbers. We're using colons. We can do substitutions. There's lots of zeros that you can break up. But at the end of the day, it's it's no, the function's no different. You're just defining where I need to go on the internet. We're just using bigger numbers so we can have more address space and remove things like NAT and, and other pieces that uh, unfortunately will probably outlive me. Unfortunately. And does IPv6 make the internet faster? So it it doesn't make any faster. The difference that you would receive is sometimes uh, working with ISPs, you know, everything is, it's not just one big network called the internet, right? It's, it's a network of networks. And so different uh, internet service providers, cloud providers, they all peer in different ways with each other. And sometimes the IPv4 peering that they have may be different than the IPv6, in which case you take a different route, uh, which could be less congested. So there are some things like happy eyeballs and things like that that exist underneath in, in the, in the uh, stack within uh, your PCs that um, will prefer one versus the other based on latency and jitter and things like that. Um, the, the, the technical answer is if you're running the same network IPv4 and IPv6, you will not see any difference in speed. Hey, Snackers. Um, we're actually going to break this up into two episodes. We were having so much fun answering your questions that we wanted to make sure we covered everything in our uh, snack size uh, episode. So um, join us next time. Uh, we'll, you'll see part two of our Q&A session. But thank you so much for joining us this week. And we can't wait to see you next week. Cheers. Thank you, Snackers.